Our second reading comes from Acts, the second chapter, verses 41 through 47. And let me find it. 41. Okay. So, those who welcome his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Awe came upon everyone, because many wondered and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. Praise God and have the good will of all people, and day by day who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. So we continue our series uh, entitled Fact or Fiction, where we uh, go through all those popular sayings that people think are from the Bible, but really aren't. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Barna Group, and they do a lot of different surveys. They do a lot of uh, especially religious-based ones. And a year or so ago, they did, they did one that I thought was interesting. They found that 65% of Americans believe the Bible answers all or most of the basic questions of life, but 44% believe the Bible, the Quran, and the Book of Mormon teach basically the same truths. 60% of Americans can't name half of the Ten Commandments, and before you judge, how many of you can do that? Uh... 63% can't name the four Gospels. 31% believe a good person can earn their way into heaven. And 81% believe that God helps those who help themselves is a direct quote from the Bible. That's the one we're talking about. It isn't in the Bible. Nowhere does it say God helps those who help themselves. It isn't in scripture anywhere. Now, some think that it originated with Benjamin Franklin in his uh, publication, Poor Richard's Almanac, in 1735. But actually, it goes all the way back to the Aesop fables. Do you, do you remember those? Um, all those little stories? Well, I'm going to go ahead and share it with you because it's short. So a wagoneer was once driving a heavy load along a very muddy way. He came to a part of the road where the wheels sank halfway deep into the mire, and the more the horses pulled, the deeper sank the wheels. So the wagoneer threw down his whip, knelt down, and prayed to Hercules. O oh, Hercules, help me in my hour of distress. But Hercules appeared to him and said, Man, don't sprawl there. Get up and put your shoulder to the wheel. The gods help them that help themselves. So there you go. Not only is it not in scripture, it's actually a prayer to somebody who didn't even exist. It's interesting though. Don't, I, I mean, we, we think about that phrase, God helps those who help themselves. And in and of itself, Doing work is not a bad thing. It's not bad to do hard work. But the thing is, right from the very beginning, it was said in Scripture, God said in Genesis 2.18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Right from the beginning, God said, You know, it's not good for you to be alone. It's not a good idea. It's not something that's really for the best. I mean, even look at the Ecclesiastes reading. Two are better, uh, are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. 
For if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe if you fall and there's nobody to pick you up. <laughs> Basically saying, you're in trouble if you fall and you're on your own, aren't you? You see, we're not to do it on our own. We're not supposed to go through life alone. I mean, look at the reading from the book of Acts. It talks about the people coming together as a community, as a family. It doesn't talk about one person doing something. It says they and everyone and all the people and all together. It doesn't say this one person did this or this one person did that. It talks about them all coming together and doing it. Coming together and doing the work. Because <clears throat> the blessings, excuse me. <clears throat> because the blessings spread out then. They spread out even further when they come together. Let's be honest though. We get told, <coughs> pardon me. That self-help is the best kind of help. What is the biggest section, it seems like, in modern bookstores? The self-help section, isn't it? It's huge. It's massive. Today, you can find so many ways to improve yourself. To help yourself. You can find books like Help Yourself. Think. Think. And grow rich. Create your own destiny. I believe in me. Ladies, don't be offended. I did not make this one up. Ten stupid things women do to mess up their lives. <laughs> and here's, here's my favorite. Try Plato, not Prozac. You know, the whole, the whole self-help genre, they think probably started in 1967 with a book by Dr. Thomas Harris entitled, I'm okay, you're okay. You remember, you remember hearing about that book? Oh yeah, that was like the beginning of it all, of where you can do it on your own. Which I got to thinking, if we're buying a book to do it on our own, doesn't that defeat the purpose? I mean, you're buying the book to tell you how to do it on your own. You're following instructions on how to do it on your own. You're not doing it on your own, are you? Americans are willing to spend millions and millions of dollars to buy books because they think there's some secret way to help themselves out of their problems. Some secret formula. Some secret expertise. It kind of reminds me of somebody who's a gambler and says they have a system. You know, you know what I'm talking about. We all have met somebody who has a system. I'm going to win at blackjack because I have a system. Yeah, these are the same people that have no money. There is no system. There's no perfect solution, right? The problem with this whole self-help genre is that it reinforces that self-centeredness instead of seeking God. I decided that uh, just in case I'm going to get into the self-help genre, though, I came up with some book titles. Uh, see what you all think. Chickenless Soup for the Vegetarian Soul. 7,000 Habits of Highly Compulsive People. The Joy of Sex. Sex, not S-E-X. Choosing the Right Religious Cult. I like this one. Stupidity for dummies. I'm okay, but you're in trouble. <laughs> Teaching yourself to read. That's the title of a book, people. Come on, keep up with me here. <laughs> How to lose five pounds in six years. <laughs> and my favorite, How to Rip People Off by Writing Self-Help Books. But isn't that true? I mean, we laugh, we joke, oh my gosh, there's probably somebody to be dumb enough to buy something like that. But haven't we all kind of at least dipped our toes into the self-help genre in some way, shape, or form? Come on, we all have. Even I have. 
we've all kind of been there like, oh, I can read a book and accomplish everything? Hmm. It, it's kind of like an infomercial. You, it, right at the beginning, you're thinking they're so stupid, and by the end, you're ready to buy three of them. Um, but the thing is, we, we have this idea of we want to be able to help ourselves. We want to do it on our own. Any of you ever done a, a, one of those do-it-yourself projects? And, and sometimes they work well, sometimes they don't. But do we really do it ourselves? No, because more often than not, you bought a kit, you've watched a video, you've looked at what somebody else has done, or somebody has instructed you to do. So you're really not doing it yourself, are you? We call it that because we want to make ourselves look good. We want to make ourselves feel good. Well, I did it all myself. So nobody helped you? Well, okay, yeah, somebody helped me. And I bought a kit. And I called a friend who actually is a professional carpenter. But I did it all on my own. Well, no, you really, really didn't. And I'm not discrediting anybody who has, has built some of these projects. Because I've seen some of the work people have done, and I have been blown away. I could literally have a master carpenter hanging over my shoulder telling me how to build something. And it's still not going to end up the way it's supposed to. Okay? But we have to recognize that we don't actually do it completely and totally on our own. We have help. We have instructions. We have advice from somebody who is better than us. We work hard at trying to keep this whole idea of doing it ourselves to ourselves. But it really isn't a new idea. It's something that our ancestors did, has, have done for hundreds of years, right? We need to understand that it's important, though, that we come together, that we work together on these projects, these, these different things. And when I say projects, I also mean life. We need to work together. We need to be doing these projects hand in hand. As Heather was saying, not one person does this all on their own. Now, granted, there are times where we have one person who's kind of in charge, that maybe has the expertise, the knowledge, the skills, the, the person who maybe has already made the mistakes and can steer us away from those. But nobody does all these wonderful projects on their own. We have to look for somebody with advice, with skills. There was a guy who, who purchased one of those do-it-yourself kits. And it was a, uh, a replica of one of those old muzzle loader guns. So he brought the, bought the box and, and uh, opened it, broke through the, the three wraps of tape with the warnings on it, tossed away the, the safety manual, threw out the warning stickers, and proceeded to assemble his gun. When it was all ready, he grabbed some powder that you have to have for these, uh, didn't actually look at what kind to get, Loaded it, put the shot in, lit the charge, pulled the trigger. And when he was in heaven, <laughs> he approached Jesus and said, Jesus, why didn't you protect me? Jesus said, I gave you six warnings, but you chose to do it on your own instead of listening to the ones who knew better. What more could I have done? And isn't that true? How many times have you done a project when you were a kid and you hurt yourself and then got mad at your parents because they didn't protect you from your idiot self? <laughs> I've done that. Come on. I think we all have had, you know, your parents may not know about it, maybe. Maybe you didn't tell them about what you did. But we've all had that. We've all made those mistakes. And it's because we don't look for help. The help that is available to us. Not only with our brothers and sisters, our family here, but through God himself. Deuteronomy 8.17 says, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. 
You see, all these skills, all these abilities come from God, and we're meant to share them, to build together, as a, again, as a family. The truth is we need each other. We need to trust. We need to rely on, depend upon each other. God gave us each other to walk alongside, to encourage, to spur each other on in our faith. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need to, to have each other to confess our sins to, as it talks about in James. In Galatians, it talks about carrying each other's burdens. In Romans, it talks about caring for each other's practical needs. First Thessalonians, we're, we're to warn each other of our sins. And Romans 12, and rejoice and mourn with each other. You see, we're to join together and do whatever it may be. Now, here's a problem. I grew up in this area. That's not the problem. <laughs> let, let me clarify. That's not the problem. The problem is, one of the things I grew up with was being told to man up. Now, ladies, you probably didn't get that. But us guys, we always got told to man up, which means do it on your own. Get up and do it. And, and that's where we're seeing a big issue right now. A big issue of, of mental health struggles. Because people are being told, man up, do it on your own. And then when they fail because they literally don't have the ability to do so, they feel worthless. They feel like they're, they're no good. And that's where a problem is big. We have these, these people who are saying, I can't do it on my own. But then they're being shouted out by the, the, the elders who are saying, do it on your own. Suck it up. How many of you heard, suck it up, buttercup, when you were a kid too? <laughs> that's what's being told to people. And, and that's not a good thing. Because we're to, told to draw together. We're told to be together. And here we have this problem of people saying, do it on your own. Who are we going to listen to? Man or God? And that's where a struggle is. Because we, we don't do it on our own. And we feel less than what we should be feeling. There's a little boy whose father took him out to the, the backyard. And there was this pretty big rock. And the father says, I want you to move that rock for me. So the little boy got down there and started struggling. Just, I mean, his little arms are trembling. His face is red. He's just a sweating. He says, I, I, I'm, I'm having trouble. And the dad said, son, just give it all you've got. Give it all you've got. And so he gets down. He's, he's always seen dad do this, so he spits on his hands, and which I never understood. That. I always thought that was gross. But anyways, so he grabs the rock, and he's trying. He's pulling, and he's trying, and it's just not getting anywhere. And the dad says, come on, son, give it all you've got. And he's pulling and he's pulling and finally he says, Daddy, I'm sorry, I just, I can't do it. He said, Son, I asked you to give it all you've got. And you've got me. You didn't ask me for help. How many of you have done that? I'll tell you right now, that's a struggle for me. I, I do it on my own. Far too often. I've gotten better. But if there's been anybody out there, and I've said there's a project I want to do, and some of you may say, well, what can I do to help? And I've said, no, I got it. Okay, I got one person nodding. Thank you for being honest. Um, <laughs> but but that's, a, that's a problem I have. So if you are like me, I want, I want to give you some advice. Let people help. And I want to give you all some advice for working with me. 
If I say I've got it, tell me again. Let me help. Seriously. Because I'm going to need, you're probably going to have to say it a few times. Because I'm, I'm stubborn too. But I need to do that. And, and the re, two reasons, two big reasons, other than God told us to, I got two other reasons. One, it works so much better when there's more people working on a project. It just is. And two, actually the bigger one, if I don't let somebody help, I could very well be robbing them of an opportunity for a blessing. Because honestly, there are times I've done projects and I thought, I have no desire to ever do this. And by the end, I'm already scheduling a time I can do it again. Just because it's a blessing to me, by blessing others, it can be a blessing to me. And so we need to use those opportunities to grow ourselves, to reach out, to do what we are trying to do. You see, when we say we've actually given it our all, if we've actually said, I've given it all I've got, and yet we're still doing it on our own, we haven't given it all we've got. We haven't put our shoulder to the grindstone. We haven't truly done that if we're doing it on our own. Again, we should do the work. Don't get me wrong. Hard work is important. But think about how much less hard the work is when there's a couple extra arms doing it. You see, we're called to be a community. Even more, we're called to be a family. A family helps. A family comes together, pulls together to do the work that we're called to do. So don't try to do it alone. Let others and God help you shoulder your burdens.